Hello and welcome to the Red Mountain Community Church podcast where you can hear conversations with the people of Red Mountain Community Church as we pursue Jesus together. Each episode normally highlights what God is doing in someone's life or a specific theme in light of what God has revealed in the Bible, but today is a little different. I'm flying solo with uh, no co-host, but in uh, just a minute you're going to hear me joined by the entire elder board of RMCC for an in-depth conversation about our Raise Up campaign for the Children's Ministry Building that you might have seen work begin on recently. But especially exciting for me in this episode is the chance for you guys to hear from the elders in an extended way, Uh, get to know their hearts and minds a bit more, and get just a bit of a sense of, of how they think, pray through and wrestle with the weighty decisions that they're required to make uh, as they lead. Throughout 2023, I attended and engaged with their meetings as a provisional elder and almost immediately wanted to find a way to let all of you in on that experience. If I hadn't joined the board myself recently, the year would have still been worth it for me just for how encouraging it was to see the wisdom care and deep humility with which these guys lead and make decisions. And I think you'll get uh, a little taste of that as you listen to this chat we had. Uh, We had to get creative to make this recording work at the end of a normal monthly meeting. I just had all the men record audio at the same time on their smartphones, just setting them on the table in front of them. And then I took those recordings and lined them up as best I could. So if the audio isn't as solid or consistent throughout, that's why. Uh, I also left some stretches of silence in that in the podcasting world would be considered dead air that you would normally trim out. But I wanted you guys to get a sense of how these guys sometimes just sit in silence, thinking and humbly waiting, leaving room for others to speak and giving space for thoughtful consideration. It's really neat to see that these men are not leading with any rash, knee-jerk reactions, and so I hope you'll appreciate experiencing some of that uh, thoughtful atmosphere. So, without further delay, here's that conversation now. Okay, this is uh, Peter Franson, uh, newly minted on the Elder Board, and uh, I want to do a sound off before we get started here so you can hopefully maybe take a crack at recognizing um, people by their voices. So we're just going to go around, when I point at you, I just want you to say your first and last name, okay? Dwayne Heinrichs. Hi, I'm Tobin Cookman. Preston Hancock. Kyle Fox. Jonathan Norton. Alan Garcia. Scott Ritter. Pete Crimmins, sorry. <laughs> All right, great, good job. <laughs> Something funny about my name? <laughs> Just the way you're all saying it. <laughs> no, you all did a wonderful job. <laughs> all right, well, I have been looking forward to having this conversation with you guys and giving people just a little bit of a sneak peek at uh, how you guys think about things, how you guys talk about things. It's been uh, a real treat for me over the last year to get acquainted with that. And uh, the topic at the uh, the center of the conversation right now is raise up. And uh, I wanna just explore with you guys some of your thinking and deliberations and processing, you know, throughout all of this. Um, So the first question is uh, why why a building? Why, we had these portables. Uh, they served us for, you know, pretty well for a num- number of years. Why are we not content with portables? Or I mean, they're getting run down, but why not replace the portables? They, they did well for a number of years, right? What's the thinking there? I'll start. Uh, for, for me... Uh, I don't think it's necessary for a church to have a building to be a church, but it certainly helps uh, the ministry in the community. It certainly helps with ease of engaging practical week in and week out ministry to have our own space. So there's a very practical element of just having buildings that I think I think uh, churches do well to capture. And I think you just have to hold that before the Lord and see what he provides. And for Red Mountain, he has provided for that. And so uh, to me and to us, I think we take that as a confirmation that this is part of his direction, is that the, the finances have been present for us to do something like this. We, we um, 
Yeah, we, we thought about replacing the portables. It's just that when we first started this project, uh, to replace the portables was going to be two to three million dollars. And so at that point, do we want to just spend two to three million dollars and get portables or do we want to spend seven and get a building? Uh, so that was kind of at that point, it's like, well, we might as well just go for it rather than pass uh, this obligation on to the next generation to try and do. Yeah, and I think we just had a growing conviction of um, how space shapes a group. Like, we can think of a room as just being a room, but how the room is set up, the condition that it's in, all those things can affect the vibe and feel of of those who are meeting in it. And so we wanted, that's where, you know, some of the, the values that we've communicated over, over time, you know, the safety, the fact that this is a place where kids can belong and recognize they're not alone as followers of Jesus, there's other children, just the, the vibe and feel of that meeting space for them. Uh, we didn't want them just having this feel of portables that we're just kind of nursing along and uh, that are crumbling and, uh, you know, just kind of make do. Uh, we wanted to create uh, an inviting, warm space where they, children felt valued being a part of it. Any other thoughts there? You know, I was, I was talking to my uh, father-in-law, who's uh, Elder Emeritus Dave Lindstrom, the great Dave Lindstrom, uh, and uh, just to see his perspective on this. And, uh, you know, he was telling me that Several years ago, before the admin building was was built, it was on the heart of the elders to build a children's building at that time. And they tried to get it going, and they tried to raise the funds, and it, the Lord, it just wasn't his timing at that point. And that's when we got the portables and the admin building instead, because somehow we, we were able to generate the funding for that. And it just seems like the Lord has been having us wait, and, and the way that this campaign has gone, and the fundraising, and uh, it's just been... Uh, an incredible testimony, I think, to God's timing that, you know, he, he wants us to move past the portables to, to this. It seems to be his His will just from a, a fact that he thwarted us in the past but is so opening the door right now. So it's kind of a neat, neat thing even to think of the history of the church and where we're at right now to build the building, I think, is cool. Okay, so I... <sighs> I'm, I'm just imagining all the other things. How? What's the what's the total cost of this thing? I don't remember numbers. So somebody shout out what what's the total cost of this built children's building? In the millions, it's like yes, it's nine million, nine point three million. Okay, that it'll end up being something. Okay, so holy cannoli, the things that we could do with nine something roughly million dollars. Um, I mean, why not take this money and give it to missionary projects that are going on right now versus building a building? I mean, you think about the great need in various overseas missions, think about uh, inner city missions and just the, I mean, just the tragedy that's going on just in the Phoenix area alone uh, that we could reach into financially. Think about Mexico missions, think about single moms. Um, there's so much need. And here we got $9 million and we're gonna make a shiny new children's building. What, what do you, how, how do you like respond to that kind of uh, feeling or reaction? What I, I'd say, uh, uh, what I would say initially to that, uh, even from a practical point of view uh, and from our experience here, because we, we received the same sort of questions when we were building the Life Center. Mm. Why not just stay in the gym? Why spend the money on that? And uh, we could give the money instead towards towards missions. Yeah. Well, what you find is in raising money for, for a building does a couple things. One, it brings everybody together towards one project. Um, and in the course of that, uh, really kind of pushing them to give financially. And what we saw was that people rose to that, and then the Lord kind of showed them what resources they actually had available for his kingdom. And so in, in engaging in that process for the building of the Life Center, um, we, you know, and then people transferred the giving towards the money 
given for the Life Center towards the general budget, our general budget increased dramatically. Mm -hmm. So over the course of 10 years, well, however long we've been in that Life Center now, it's not quite been 10, but we've been able to give more towards missions uh, because of our annual budget giving year on year than we would have been able to had we just given that one-time amount towards missions then. Mm -hmm. uh, and so similarly, when you, when you come together like this, then people recognize, wow, it's not just giving towards missions once, give that money towards missions. You're, you're talking about decades of increased giving towards missions. So from a practical point of view, uh, it just helps a congregation recognize what the Lord can do with their resources and, and more generosity results. Mm -hmm. And it's not in lieu of missions, it's in addition to missions yeah. that we do now. And this building is going to be training the next generation to go out to all corners of the, of the world. And so not only are we going to continue what we're doing now here and abroad, but the next generation is the key. Mm. Yeah, and to follow up with that and what Pete's saying is that we're committed to children's ministry as far as children's a part of the church. They're an important part of the church, um, and we want them to be rooted and grounded in the gospel. And um, we also want, uh, this, and then kind of building off of what uh, Preston was saying as far as the practicalities, is that we have a mission field right here in the Falcon District in East Mesa. So we are looking to, um, there's such need right here in our neighborhood that as we um, create space for students, whether it ends up being special needs, preschool, Sundays, midweek, and all that, that more children are coming. Of course, their families, their parents then are coming. And that even, it just perpetuates the gospel both here. So if we're thinking of Acts 1 8 and Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So it's all part of God's plan. And we strongly believe in missions. So this is the mission field that the Lord has put on our heart for now, and we definitely have a heart, as Pete was saying, and we all have a heart for the mission field globally. There's just different ways to interpret and think of that. Uh, but the history of our church and so many people come to our church because we have a strong children's and youth ministry, and that just helps us to minister to the families that are here in this local mission field, and then to be able to reach beyond. Okay, I want to grab onto something that you said there. You said that something to the effect of that this, that this is what the Spirit has placed on our hearts now. And then, Alan, earlier you mentioned um, the great saint Dave Lindstrom <laughs> talking about. Um, He's a saint now. Talking about looking ahead. Uh, you know, we'll just kill, come up with more grand titles as we go on here. Um, just looking ahead at the at, at a children's building eventually. So that was kind of an issue of timing. So... That's kind of, I guess, what I'm also curious about is the timing for right now and how you how you sort through um, what you would maybe call a conviction of the spirit that it's that it's time to. You know, there's it's interesting. Something that you know I've been sorting through with you guys over the last year is some language that like is not the type of language that I use and uh, I, I sometimes will call churchy language. And so people will sometimes say, well, I felt convicted about something or the spirit was doing, you know, was, was moving in this certain way. And so I'm interested in kind of getting an idea from you guys what that looked like for you either corporately as a board or individually, however you know you want to you want to speak on this, what did it look like? What were the what were the markers of the Holy Spirit convicting you that the timing for to complete the campus was now? So I think that the discussions about the children's building uh, had been going on for a number of years, and and uh, it's something that we had as an elder board had a desire to pursue uh, while looking for the Spirit's leading and guidance in timing and what it was that he wanted uh, for Red Mountain, um, as well as the timing that he, that he had in mind. And so it was a matter of discussion and prayer uh, within the elder group over a course of a number of years. Mm. And uh, we got to a point where it was becoming uh, a more frequent and and uh, more 
involved discussion and we decided as a group to set aside, at least for me, the, the, the compelling moment in time, I would say, would be uh, about five or so years ago where as an elder board, we set aside a Saturday morning to come together and to spend time discussing it and praying about the Spirit's leading specifically uh, in regards to a children's building and moving forward with campus completion. And that morning, as we talked and then spent a considerable amount of time in prayer, the, the questions that we had in our minds for the Lord and for each other, as we prayed about it, there, there was a great sense of conviction internally, individually in each of us, uh, and a sense of of affirmation from the Spirit that now was the time to begin moving forward. And for me, that that Saturday morning prayer time and the what we sensed, what I sensed as the movement of the Spirit in our hearts and lives was the moment where we understood now is the time to begin the process. Hmm. And so that was the moment in time then when we began uh, seeking plans, discussing um, discussing how to move forward, discussing funding, and, and all of the, the nuts and bolts began to move forward after that time of prayer. And uh, my wording would be conviction of the Spirit that now, now is the time that he had for Red Mountain to move forward with this project. Now, is that uh, universal or do any of you uh, have any other kind of moments or markers that kind of uh, were indicators to you that uh, that the Holy Spirit was convicting you that, that the timing was now? So, Peter, I think, you know, to confirm what Dwayne was saying is I think we spent this time in prayer praying about, you know, what the Lord was in the Spirit were going to lead us to next in regards to a children's building because we saw what was happening. We had children ministry was growing. We were expanding out of our current um, capacity of the buildings, the portables and, and other buildings we were using at the time. And we weren't quite uh, able to meet the growth that was there and we prayed. And as we as elders prayed together, shared how the spirit was leading us in his word and what scriptures were being brought up, it became evident that we needed to move forward. And if you think back, uh, when we moved forward, we actually didn't start funding the children's building right away. We actually did the improvements on the gym first Mm -hmm. because we made a decision that we would do what we had cash for. And we said, if the spirit is in this and we can pay this for cash, it was a little bit like a fleece that it was out there saying, hey, I think we need to move forward together and now start thinking about the children's building. And when we did the gym project and redid all the classrooms, expanded the gym, it was all paid for in cash and by volunteer hours. So now there was a first sort of validation that the spirit was in this. And as we began to think about, hey, how about fundraising now for this building? If the Lord can provide this, can he provide nine plus million dollars for a children's building? Well, yes, he can. And, and we just kept praying. Before even Kyle stood up and started talking about it, we spent months and months in prayer, asking the Lord and seeking the Lord for where, where he wanted us to go. And so as, as I began hearing the Spirit speak in each of the men's voice as elders, it was convicting and confirming to me, we need to keep moving forward. So it's... It sounds like, and you guys can uh, give me your own perspective on this, but what I feel like I'm picking up from you guys is that as you're discerning um, the Spirit's voice, you're factoring in a number of things. You're factoring in uh, Scripture and principles of Scripture related to all kinds of things that are relevant to the subject at hand. In this case, you know, ministering to children, handling finances, all these kinds of things. Um, you're looking to steward that money well. You're looking at the needs of, uh, uh, of, of families and children. You are um, 
being aware of the, those subjective elements um, that, that might be kind of a, 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 an impression um, or something that resonates with you that maybe sort of gets your attention and leads you to think more deeply about, you know, these kinds of things. So it sounds like it's really like trying to identify what it looks like to sense the conviction of the spirit. Would you say that it's a complication, it, it, you know, this kind of like this combination of a lot of complicated different things that at the end of the day uh, seem to be leading and, and bringing focus to what you will, at the end of the day, identify as a conviction of the spirit? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, and I, I think uh, you know, for me, the first time I heard about this project was actually... Um, there was a night where the elders decided that they would put me forward as a candidate for a lead pastor. Okay. And we had a prayer time with me. It was in the, it was December of 2016. And, uh, our former lead pastor who happens to be my dad was also at that meeting. Okay. And as the elders and I felt the great confirmation that, uh, that the Lord was calling me to be the next lead pastor. I don't remember who, which elder turned to my dad but they asked him, Bob, what's some things that you would like to see get done before your time on earth is done? Hmm. What, what are some things that you wish you could have accomplished? And he very, with great conviction, but also quickly, two things. He said, I, w- I want the church to be debt free and I want there to be a children's building. Hmm. Those are two things I really feel like I wish I could have gotten done. And I had never thought about those things. I didn't know there was a history of like processing about this children's building. But at that moment, I realized, man, there's this huge stream of prayer and conversation and leading that the elders have already been. I'm like jumping into that. And so that was a realization of like how long the elders have been processing the idea of this children's building. And it needs to get done. It's been kicked down the road long enough. Uh, And so at that point, even, I felt the spirit, not just because it was my dad, but I felt the spirit even tugging at my heart saying, this needs to happen. This is something I want to do. And it was at that moment that I I became even pretty convinced in my own soul, like, yeah, this is something that needs to be done. It's something the Lord's been wanting to do, but Red Mountain just hasn't been able to do it yet. And why not now? And then, so that was December of 16, but... The prayer time that Dwayne first talked about was April of 2018. So basically another year and a half of processing and praying and wondering and going through all kinds of options. And maybe we should just add a second story in the gym and, and uh, you know, all these sorts of things. We eventually landed on this is the project. This is the, the cheapest we can do it <laughs> and most effective we can do it for what we feel like the Lord can raise through our church. And, and I can identify with that a lot too. With, you know, I think me, uh, John, and Scott came on in 2009? 20. 20, 2020. I thought we were a little bit older than, uh, than we are uh, elder-wise. Um, so we were kind of jumping in the stream of kind of the prayers that had already been going on. And I think for me, I I think I wrestled with a lot of the the questions that are that are you know here, initially as far as well you know what is the the big deal with building a children's building and all those things, but just again trusting in the the strength of the the elders and the prayers that had gone before me, but the way that the spirit has really um, shaped me in all of this is just to see you know not only the prayers that have come before but the way that the spirits even partnered with us in this great labor of uh, fundraising and and getting the project actually moving and going it's been astounding because um, who who chooses to start fundraising the like literally the week that covid st- starts I, I think it 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 was about exactly that time. And it was this crazy time of uncertainty where even as a board, just deciding what we were doing on Sunday morning was we didn't know what we were doing. And yet somehow we we started the project in this time of great uncertainty and the Lord just kept meeting uh, prayer after prayer and, and benchmark after benchmark 
uh, to get us where we are today. So it really challenged my faith and and being somewhat skeptical, but then being like, "Oh, the Lord's behind this. I need like I need to get on the ball on this." So that's how the Spirit is at least confirmed to me is just the response. Um, the the wind of the Lord is is blowing towards this church building. You know, it just it's just this incredible thing. And just to even add, <clears throat> part of that wind that was blowing is you could just see in our church in 2016 and 17 and 18 this like renewed interest and growth and passion for children's ministry. Hmm. And you could see the Spirit inspiring people. And, and new things were happening in our children's ministry that we hadn't seen before. I think because Red Mountain had tried to do this, but the church just wasn't in it. The Spirit just wasn't leading people to be passionate about children's ministry. And that shifted. I mean, clearly we've seen that now in terms of the fundraising, but also the heart of our people as, as the elders were talking with people and, and praying this through and involved in so many conversations. We could just sense Man, there's just a heart of Red Mountain is in this project. And they they don't just care about building a building, but we care about discipling kids. And we need to demonstrate that. And we need to show that that's our heart. We get to see that in our congregation. That was maybe the final key uh, for us is just recognizing and seeing, man, the Lord is stirring our church in this. We would be foolish not to go with it. Hmm. Okay, so you're all... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Scott. Well, I was just going to add, kind of coming full circle back to your question as far as how do you know that it's of the Spirit. Um, So when you do all these things and you mention the compilation of all this and and whatever else, and then when you take a step forward, there's, there's fundraising, yes, but there's also a quietness and a peace that it's difficult to explain, but, you know... It's the, it's the opposite of when you try and do something and then you're waking up about it in the middle of the night, you're having, um, you're having all kinds of conflicting thoughts, you're having conflict among, you know, people are having conflicting ideas as opposed to you're having this like, oh, that just sits well with my soul. And then you find out you're talking to other people in discussions that, oh, you know, you have this confirmation with the, in each other so that it's, it's happening. It's not just a group think and a confirmation bias. That's a real thing, but it's it's a it's a confirmation from the Lord that's not it just it's not natural. It's not just human. It's it's from the Lord. It's from the Spirit. And I know for someone that you know, for me, in a, in a time when I didn't have uh, as as strong of a walk with the Spirit or wasn't as used to that and using that kind of language, that might sound a little bit strange, but um, that's just the best way that I can e- explain it. And you see that, I think you see that in scripture a lot, where you see someone like, you know, David wanting to build the temple, and but then it's like, no, that's not what I have for you, right? It's, it's you know, you're, this is your role. And so the Lord, you know, it just didn't wor- work for him and then for, for Solomon to do it. And then you could see the floodgates just open and it, and it happened and the Lord was blessing. And there's many other examples of that in scripture where, where human beings are trying to decipher God's will. What is the spirit, mo- how is the spirit moving? And he has a way. He, he made us. He knows how to uh, to confirm, to move us, to steer us, or how to you know push us forward and encourage us. John, what do you got? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, reiterate what Alan sort of alluded to as well. That um, we had a really like the question you asked is, is really interesting to me, um, and probably Alan and Scott as well because. You know, when all this was taking place, we weren't on the elder board. We're, you know, we're committed to Red Mountain. Uh, this is our home church. We're members of the church. Um, so we have this unique perspective of 2020. We then came on the board as provisional to kind of see more of the inner workings of how the elder board worked. And one thing that I, I clearly remember sticking out to me um, in reference to, you know, how were we convinced or convicted that the spirit was moving this way was just to see the how serious and how much prayer and thought had gone on for many years by the existing elders up to that point um, and, and just having a love and a trust for the, the leadership of the church um, was just another um, thing I think that really helped. You know, even though we're in COVID now and, and all this uncertainty in the world, um, 
to, to know that, yeah, this is where the Lord is, is kind of moving and, and um, wanting the, the church to move in that direction. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I appreciate just kind of like that note of, of recognizing what's been uh, going on in the processing of, of others before you, around you. Scott, you mentioned the idea of, of peace, and I really appreciated where you took that comment because I think um, a lot of people would say, well, the Holy Spirit confirms things to me when I just feel peace about it. You know, but what you expanded on was like, well, it's not just the peace that you're feeling. It's peace in those of you that are working through and processing this stuff, you know. And uh, uh, I think that's much steadier ground than our just kind of our subjective feelings of like, oh, I'm, I'm calm right now. <laughs> you know? um, but I mean, once you guys are on the same page, you press the go button um, and then things really start to ramp up. Uh, then you start seeing this thing start to crystallize and take shape in front of you, or you have to make decisions to give it shape. Suddenly, there's all these decisions that have to be made, not just, yes, we want a children's building. And so what, what are some of like the, maybe what you would classify as the hard discussions that you've had as an elder board as you process this decision and uh, after realizing, yes, we're going forward on this? So I think for me, some of the hard discussions, and Alan mentioned it, was here we get ready to start fundraising after we made the decision and COVID hits. And we're no longer thinking about how do we raise money? That's not the number one priority. It's what do we do for church that weekend? And then we're meeting every two weeks. I think we're meeting every other week. And here we are meeting every other week, and we're trying to say, are we going to let 50 people in? Are we going to let have 100 people in? We're just trying to have a service. How do we even think about offerings and donations? And watching and, and sorting through that and saying, wow, should we put the building on hold? Is, is the Lord telling us we need to wait? Because nobody knows what COVID really is yet. And and we had to wrestle with that. I think another item that I had to wrestle with later was the building doesn't cost X amount. It just keeps going up and up and up. And is that, is the Lord saying, no, wait? Is he saying, wait, as the, Lord, as the price keeps continuing to go up? And, and then this isn't the first attempt. And the people we had talked to about raising funds, the hardest to raise funds for is the children's building. It's easier for a life center. It's easier for a worship center. It's easier for other type buildings. The, the, one of the lowest is a children's building in the middle of COVID with prices going through the roof, supply chain issues. It seemed like what a time for the spirit to move. Yet for me, as we wrestled through this, I did have that same piece that Scott talked about. And Peter, as you sort of alluded to, is in all that, as we wrestled with what the Lord was doing and we listened to the voices of the spirit as they spoke through each of them, and it was each of us, that there was not this great anxiety about we have to stop. It's, we need to keep going. Let's see where the Lord's hand is. And through the middle of it, donations continue to come in. Whereas other churches actually were closing their doors, Red Mountain's doors were staying open. And to close this out doing that would almost have been like to me to say, I'm not allowing God to do his work. To close the door on this, when other churches are closing, our door is open, he's providing, then we're closing and shutting him out. And that, that was just not, not an option in my mind. And even when the, when the price went from seven to nine and a half million, you know, that was a kind of a kick in the gut, but it wasn't because it was, the spirit was behind it. And so we just kept on, kept on moving. And it was really a special time not to be freaked out about that or concerned or worried. It was just, um, just, okay, Lord, this is what you have in front of us. We're going to continue moving. As we talk about those, those times, I do, um, all the guys that were part of the discussions, I just feel like I wanted to just list their names because mm. they were huge yeah. in all this. Some are not living at church anymore, but um, in alphabetical, it's just Keith Braun, Lee Carl, Bob Fox, Rex Griswold, Paul Klimke, Dave Lindstrom, Kevin Norton, Bob Pratt, and Richard Weisenberger. And those are all really, they were faithful men through mm. all this and led well. Going back to what Tobin was saying, and this is a perfect example of how 
the Lord sometimes just works in these situations that you're you're not expecting. Like you're thinking it's just going to be a straight line building project, fundraising project, but then COVID happens, and meeting every other week ended up being so instrumental because every ever every time we met. It always came back to was coming back to that, what, what is the Lord doing? What is the Lord's heart for Red Mountain Community Church? And like Tobin was saying, no, we want to keep gathering. I mean, the, the scripture calls us and tells us, right, that we need to be gathering as people. The whole idea of a, a congregation, a group of believers gathering together for corporate worship and for corporate teaching. And that just gave us that much more of an opportunity to be uh, confirming in e- with the confirming with each other, and for the Lord to be confirming in us what was going on week to week as far as worship service, but also in, in the same way with the, the the project and this building. Like you know, no, this is something we want to keep doing. And as stressful of a time it was, and a very difficult time, and I'm not discounting that at all for people that really struggled, and I have friends that really struggled, and their families were torn apart because of some of the effects of COVID, the Lord still was able to utilize that in this group for this project that we're doing this talk about to really confirm it and to keep it moving forward and to actually give it momentum. And you know what's incredible with this question, Peter? I, I was like, I've been taken aback by this question because I was like, oh, I really got to think of something. Like, when did we throw chairs at each other and, you know, really disagreed? Well, there was that one time. There was, there was that one time. Yeah, yeah. I, forg- I forgave you. I'm teaching classes on forgiveness. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the amazing thing is I, I honestly can't really think of an actual hard conversation hmm. either with the board or with a church person personally that I've had where it's actually like someone's actually disagreed with the plan for the building or really put up like a big foot down of like, guys, we need to really think through whether we want to keep going or not. There were those big roadblocks where we were like, man, I don't know how the Lord's going to do it. But the attitude and the spirit of the board, it was very unanimous and somehow he's going to get us over this COVID thing. Somehow he's going to get us over the fundraising thing and the 2 million more and, um, so, yeah, I, I think the question itself, it's a little bit hard to answer because I personally, I, I don't I haven't experienced a really hard, like a really, you know, ugly, uh, ugly conversation or a difficult uh, or even contentious type of conversation. No, I would say, I guess I was thinking along the same lines. I don't I didn't find any conversation hard, but every conversation was labored. Mm-hmm. So, in other words, there was never a point like we started off talking about expanding the gym building. We really pursued that, and we went down that road and, and found out structurally it just couldn't work. Uh, and then, you know, it, exorbitant and just wouldn't work. And then the next, so everything, we, we were never blasé and kind of going, oh, well, the Lord's just kind of, oh, well, it'll just be fine. It was, okay, well, here's this. What about this? What about that? And a lot of back and forth and a lot of very, so labored. But, yeah, never... Um, contentious or, or mean-spirited or fearful or it was just what is it and 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 never you know what I've appreciated was there was never anybody who held back uh, so if, if somebody had a, a concern uh, it didn't matter like 90% of the board is having a conversation one way in the moment one of us in the room would sit there and go yeah but guys what about this mm. and and so that led to some long meetings. Um, never mean spirit. Nobody then rallied and said, well, <laughs> it was like, okay, well, let's, let's wrestle with that. What about this? What about that? So labored, but not, I w- I'm with you. I don't think it was ever contentious. Probably, and probably a more intense moment was trying to decide, are we going to do a pre-pledge and trying to decide, should we as elders pledge and come to the congregation with our yeah. pledge amount? Mm. There's a lot to wrestle through there uh, because that can be perceived a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. And is that good leadership or is that prideful leadership? What what is that? And we kind of went back and forth on that. But there's also just the moment of, well, let's say you do that. What what's going to come out of that and how disappointing is it going to be? Or, you know, there's it's risky. Mm -hmm to do that. So there wasn't any contentious or ugliness there, but it, it was it was kind of a hard it was a risky moment. 
uh, to do that and to do that twice, once in, in 2020 as a board before we went to the congregation and again before we started these pledges, that's, a, that's risky. But, but in the end, our, our heart was to say, you know, this is something that we feel we want to do and we, we think the Lord's in this and we're not asking the, con- the congregation to do something we aren't do- willing to do ourselves. And uh, we're committed to this project and we're committed to sacrificial giving, uh, you know, and the amount is somewhat meaningless at that point. It's really a, a call to ourselves amongst ourselves as, as brothers to say, are we in this is really what it was. And that was another maybe confirmation is to realize, man, we are all in this and the Lord has enabled us. And so that was, that was a hard conversation, but not because it was. Uh, a big debate. It just is a kind of an intense, you know, in, in eldering and leading there, and you're trying to pursue the spirit, it gets very intense. There's a lot of pressure. Weighty. Yeah, it's heavy. So that was a, that was a moment for me that was like, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> but how glorious it's been, you know, and how, how uh, amazing. And that was one of our fo- focuses that David brought up, the glorious power of Yahweh. And we just kept seeing that over and over in the midst of that weightiness that he would just keep providing. Yeah. Well, something that's been really cool for me to watch over the last year has been how you guys uh, deliberate and work through things that, as you said, Preston, for a little while, the conversation might seem like it's leaning one way. And then like one person will bring out something that suddenly like light bulbs go on (laughs) all around the room. It's like, oh, wow. And I'm just silently sitting there, you know, initially thinking, oh, well, this seems pretty straightforward. And then suddenly someone just says, well, what about this angle? And I'm like, whoa, that changes everything. (laughs) So it's so cool to see um, this kind of like, uh, I think it was Pete I was talking to you about this earlier today, that the, the elder board being this kind of really cool microcosm of the larger body of Christ that is the church to see how all these different strengths and wirings of individuals come together and, and, uh, and, and work together in a way that produces something uh, just really uh, amazing to, to watch unfold. Okay, so you guys are... Deliberating about this stuff, you're uh, addressing issues, solving problems. In the midst of all of this, what indications have you seen that that despite the the difficult things you're deliberating on, that even so, Yahweh seems to be moving in this project? What what were some of like the indicators to you that that was the case? The building's fully funded. <laughs> That is huge. That is huge. <laughs> I, I would say that, but but it's how that happened. Uh, stories of people who had investments that weren't doing anything, and and then they said, "Hey, Lord, whatever happens with this, uh, I'm I'm just going to give whatever happens to this to to the children's building." And then all of a sudden, it, the investments take off, mm. and and something happened. Um, the fact that our children's ministries continue to grow while this is going on uh, is really, really cool. And it's not just numerically, though, that, though it is growing numerically. It's, it's who's showing up and the kinds of stories we're hearing about uh, families coming because, man, finally our kids are connected and they're, they're getting something out of this. So those would be two things for me, what the Lord seems to be doing in children's and, and how the Lord has raised this money so far. It's been amazing. I think for me, just seeing the, the generosity that we've always said since our church was, since I've been on the board for, what, 16 or 17 years, that we we know have big givers here. We've always said that. <clears throat> now we've got pledges showing up without even being pledged, mm-hmm. and they're 100,000, 150,000, and they're just showing up. And that, to me, is just a confirmation that the Spirit is behind it. Mm. And people are happy doing it. You know, it's exciting. Mm. It's not like a, a responsibility or a duty. It's just a, it's a privilege. 
I think, Peter, a couple confirmations in addition to the money coming in and children's ministries growing as have been mentioned. I think that the people that the Lord put in our congregation at this time, on the other side, I think our owner's rep, Bill Copeland, mm. was here at this time. And the work that he's done alone has, has literally saved hundreds of thousands of dollars on this project as he and the contractor have worked through items. He and the city of Mesa have worked through items. I think he was here uh, for this time. I think another amazing thing is some subs, some contractors that are going to be working on it are actually here at church and they gave profit away that their companies were willing to give. Yes, they're going to work on this building, but it just makes the building cost that much less. And so, you know, even though the building is is such a high cost and has gone up more than a couple million dollars plus, it's actually come down and it could have been much, much higher without people that are currently sitting in the seats of Red Mountain stepping up in ways that we had no idea, we didn't even know they would do. And it was just like the Lord just provided this at this time. And it's like right now when we're finally ready to get permits. And I think the third thing in is the Lord's timing, Yahweh's timing, is we would have already, if it would have been our our decision as elders, we would have already started this building last year. We would have already started it, and we probably would have had a loan, and we might not have got the pricing that we got, but because the permit took longer, and when it was the Lord's timing, we now have pledges that basically cover this whole building. And it's a whole different mindset that we can approach building this because it's his timing, not our timing. And that's what this whole building project has been, completely back to where Kyle mentioned where Bob was at. He wanted to build this building when he was still the lead pastor. But that wasn't Yahweh's timing. And I think that that's the third area of affirmation in addition to the other items the minute mentioned. Yeah, two things for me... Um... Preston mentioned one of them, just seeming like every week on Sundays there are new families coming to church um, with children and they're looking for a place where God's word is taught on on a regular basis, that they're in the scriptures. Um, And I feel like that's confirmation to know that this this building, this project is going to help foster that community, that environment to continue to uh, share the gospel of Jesus to the next generation. Um, and then the other thing uh, I think that's really helped me too is to see just the overall health of the children's ministry. Um, you know, recently we just heard a report from uh, Pastor Becky that that they almost have too many volunteers. That there's so many people um, wanting to give of their time to the children's ministry and to pour into them. A lot of times we can focus on, you know, giving of of our money. And and yes, that's important for a project. Um, But so many people want to pour in and disciple children. Um, What a huge thing to have that right now as we're breaking ground on the the new kids building. Uh, How, as you've seen... Yahweh seem to be moving in this whole process here, doing all these different things. How has that movement on his part grown either your uh, individual faith or your collective faith as a board? Either one of those that you anybody wants to speak on would be great. So, Peter, I, I have a comment on this one. Um, I think I was I was there when Kyle mentioned that I can't remember the elder that asked the question and where Bob said he, wa- he wished he would, the church would be debt-free and we'd have a children's building. And sometimes when this project's come up, I think of those names of the elders who faithfully serve that Pete mentioned earlier as we've been talking. And the scripture that kept running through my mind was something that David said back in Samuel, and I felt like this was a building of my faith through this process. In in, in Samuel, 2 Samuel 7, in verse 18, King David goes and he went in and he sat before Yahweh, and he asked, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? And yet this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord God. And this was David's prayer of gratitude, you know, as they're getting ready to 
as he's thanking him for this great covenant that God's Yahweh's made with him. And I was thinking, we as men and as elders were given this opportunity for whatever reason that it was our time as elders when other elders had left. And it felt like, why us? Why why me being one of the elders to be a part of this decision? And all I could look back was, was David's words to say, this is but a small thing for you, O Lord. And even when the numbers were big and the timing wasn't working out and we had COVID going on, it was but a small thing for the Lord. And now looking back and seeing the pledges and everything, it is but a small thing for the Lord. Great for us as humans, but a very small thing for Yahweh. I think in that, that's where I think, you know, I can speak to myself um, uh, growing my individual faith. Because I think I, well, when we engaged in this, I believed God was going to provide. And yet throughout this process, as, as different uh, people have contributed, whether it was their time and energy, because uh, there have been volunteers from the church that have contributed their thoughts and their expertise to this, whether that's Bill or, or others who have who've stepped in, um, or financially, when those big offerings came in of time and money, I found myself getting surprised. So then I was like, well, if I have faith, why am I getting surprised? Uh, and I think that's where God was pushing me, going, well, you've got faith, but you kind of don't. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's how I've been pushed a little bit to go, well, maybe, you know, I need to grow in my understanding of that. God's capable of more. Even though I would sit here and say to you guys, no, I believe God's going to provide, and I'd mean it. And yet there's something in my core uh, maybe because I was here when we raised money for the, the Life Center and we still had to take out a loan. Uh, or maybe it's just, uh, I'm an idiot sometimes. Um, I just don't, I don't trust God. So that, that's, it's pushed me in my faith. Uh, how were any of you unexpectedly challenged um, throughout all of this? I think we were, I mean, initially we felt challenged in putting it forth and, you know, yeah, we'll commit to doing this. And if we have to t- do a, take a loan or do this and debt service that the Lord will provide. I think what we ended up, well, for me, I ended up being challenged kind of what building off what Preston was saying is that um, I'm, you know, putting God in a box or having too low of expectations of what he really could do. Um, and it just showed me, and we're seeing not just financially, but we're seeing so many um, so many things happening at Red Mountain that are just fresh, new lives being changed, which have been happening for years and years. But I guess just either seeing more of it or being closer to it, um, it just kind of again, reiterating what Preston was saying is that, you know, and what Tobin was saying is that, you know, but this is actually a pretty small thing for the Lord to do to raise this amount of money. And it just challenged me to have more faith and to um, continue be thinking about, well, what else is the Lord? What is God's vision? What is What else am I thinking just too small? You know, what is God's true vision for my life for and for the life of this church? You know, how far does he want to take this? Just knowing and coming back to what his heart is. His heart is to reach, reach everybody, right? The, the call is going out to everybody. So for us to partner and really be committed um, with children's ministry and already been thinking what's next with, with missions and a leadership and different kind of to be able to, to send people out um, and just to really be challenged to grow in uh, not having too low up ex- expectations of what God is looking to do. You know, there's been a, a growth in me of the, there's a there's such an important aspect of uh, the financial stewardship that we each engage in and that the church engages in corporately um, with the actual uh, growth of holiness in the church as well. 
there, there's there's a biblical connection there that I think the Lord has been helping me see. And there was a, a passage that kind of was stirring in my heart about a year or two ago. I think it won the elder retreats towards the end of Philippians, uh, where Paul is talking about how you know he's he's complimenting the Philippians and thanking them for this great gift they've given him uh, of of money. You know, it wasn't just that they you know they gave him like a good amount of money. And uh, in uh, chapter four, verse seventeen, he said, "Not that I seek the gift." So it's easy to get you know wrapped up in the money. Like, man, we we're getting all this great money, and even as we we give our money, we can get wrapped up in the amount and and what we're giving. But Paul says it's not that. It's not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. Um, there's there's a certain fruit that that the Lord builds in me, and builds in our church and our congregation as we engage in. And these disciplines of giving um, uh, for the Lord's work, and and I don't know, I don't I don't exactly know the nuts and bolts of that and how that works, but that's been challenging to me to go, man. If if you really engage your heart with your finances and your giving, there there's a fruit that that actually the Lord brings about in your life. Um, that's that's pretty significant, and I feel like I've experienced that personally over the last couple of years, and I'm challenged to. To make that connection more, not to divorce my finances from my from my my sanctification journey. It's kind of a it's part of it. Yeah. Um, so that's that's been a challenge to me and a, and a, a welcome uh, area of growth. Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested in just kind of jumping off of that um, about that kind of like that perspective shift on your own giving. So I'll open this up to everybody. Over about the past three years. Has this project in any way changed your view of giving, changed your view of financial sacrifice? Any kind of like little light bulb moments or kind of new perspectives, anything along those lines? I, I think kind of like what I was sharing about faith, I thought I had faith and yet I kind of have a, a deeper understanding now. Um, I would say the same thing about generosity. I wouldn't say I've learned anything novel in the sense of, boy, I'd never knew that before. But I understand it in a deeper way, and that's just how much giving shapes your heart. This is what Alan was talking about. There's, there's something about that process. And, and, and watching that happen and the unity that's happening uh, that we're experiencing right now at Red Mountain, um, it's not just a couple of people who are really pumped about this building and everybody else is like, okay, cool. Um, that moment that we had that Sunday morning where everybody wore the blue T-shirts and we had that worship outside all together and then just saw everybody go out and pray over this thing with mm. their families mm. was deeply moving. And, uh, and I'm not one given to tears often, and yet. It was just deeply impactful mm. because of that unity. And, and that unity, I think, came in part uh, because people were giving mm. as they were able and so I think that. Uh, so would I have said before, oh, yeah, giving, I would have. But I, I think I, under, I, I grasp it on a deeper level, I think. I think one of the longings of my heart uh, for the people of Red Mountain in this project was, was that it, uh, there was a longing in my heart for this project to be one that that gave the opportunity, but also that gave the spirit the opportunity to really work in the hearts and minds of the people of Red Mountain to realize the blessings that God has in store for us when we are obedient and faithful stewards of all that he has blessed us with. And that that's very, very different than a prosperity gospel type of a perspective. Mm -hmm. But yet the principles of scripture uh, that deal with finances are very clear and they are throughout scripture. And and God calls us to to be obedient stewards. He shows us examples and there are parables of, as examples of what happens when we are faithful with what God has given us and that, that we respond to him and are obedient in giving back to him. And this project gives, gives Red Mountain 
uh, people the opportunity to step into that in a real and uh, visible way. And just just a, a scripture that comes to my mind that, that Jesus uh, is speaking and kind of um, reminds us of just that, that principle of generosity, that principle of obedient stewardship uh, in Luke chapter 6, verse 38. He says, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And so that blessing that comes back to you is not specifically or solely a financial blessing. But yet, I think each of us have seen in this room over the course of our lives, as we have been faithful stewards, it is incredible how God has turned around and blessed us in ways that we could never have imagined. Mm -hmm. And that oftentimes isn't financial, yet sometimes it is. But yet it is those blessings poured out into our lives, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, he has poured blessings into our lives. And a deep longing that I have for each member of Red Mountain is that they would step into that and see what God has for them and just see how he will bless them as they step out in faith and obedience to what it is that he's calling each one of us in that financial stewardship faithfulness and then just step back and watch what he's done. And we're seeing it. Nine million dollars plus, including the pledges. How he, how he is pouring out his blessings upon Red Mountain. We're seeing transformation of lives and we're seeing, uh, we're seeing people change. And, and those blessings are just overflowing. You know, on your question... Um one of the words you talked about was is like financial sacrifice. And I think sacrifice um, really stuck out to me over these three years of, of this uh, campaign to, to raise money for the kids building. Um, I, I grew up in a, a Christian family that taught tithing and it was just that's a part of my dna you know um you, your 10 percent first fruits of your, your paycheck always goes to the church and then maybe you support a missionary and so i've you know and please know my heart when you're listening to this that this isn't like to brag or anything but like that's just how our families operated our our entire lives is is giving to the church and giving some extra to missionaries um but i don't feel like I've really experienced like sacrificially giving where like where is money coming going to come from to make ends meet or whatnot and in these past three years when when our, our family decided to be a part of the raise up campaign I feel like one thing after another from you know March of 2020 our AC units go out and then a few months later our whole bathroom floods and then a few months later there was an issue with our mortgage where we had to pay things out of pocket and it just keeps going and going and to what Dwayne is saying about this blessing um, even though there's hardship and we're giving sacrificially I've seen that an incredible blessing of having a deeper understanding of what it means to have a reliance on on the Lord and um, have faith that, that he will get us through, you know, any type of situation. Um, and that's been a, a beautiful thing to, to see that sacrifice. And I know there's times when, when I'm, I sin and I think, well, maybe I could just stop giving to the, the church and take care of these other issues. Um, but the Lord quickly reminds me of, of dependence on him and reliance. And um, that's just been a, a great thing to for my life and our family's life to, to experience sacrificially giving and to see how the Lord does provide and, and take us through different issues that come up. Yeah, that sacrificial giving speaks to uh, us as, a, as worshipers too. I remember years ago when I was the worship pastor, I talked to uh, Bob, uh, who was the lead pastor at the time, Bob Fox, and um, asked him, you know, what, how do we know when our church is growing in maturity in our worship? Um, and I can't remember exactly how he phrased it, but I mean, the nuts and bolts of what he said was, well, you'll see it in the giving. 
you know, that's as people are really growing in their understanding of worship and submitting that it's going to overflow in just their lives because they're going to begin to give sacrificially. They're going to truly prioritize Yahweh um, in, a, in a way that's, that's worshipful and really submitting to him. Um, is there, throughout all this time, any, any scripture that's personally spoken to you or, or come to mind through this process for any of you? So, Peter, I have one that's out of uh, Esther, and it's in Esther 4, and it's in uh, verse 14. And Mordecai is is giving a message that he once passed on to Queen Esther, and he's asking her to speak to the king on behalf of the Jews. And he says, uh, um, for if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come from someone else. And uh, he says, who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And this verse was shared with me when I was wondering about being an elder and and, and being a part of this process. And a, a former elder, Bill Copeland, came up and shared this verse with me and said, this is the word that I feel like the Lord has given me for you today. And... That has hung in my mind, and I've thought this verse all the way back to, and I keep reiterating these elders that Pete mentioned very early, who are no longer on the elder board, but they were for the time of the vision, and they were the ones that sort of started this process, not five years ago, 15 years ago. And they were the ones that were thinking about putting children first, and they were the ones that were here for such a time as this. And then I look around the table and I look at the new elders that, that came into the process, John and, and, and Scott and, and Alan, and they jumped right in and they listen as they said, and the Spirit's telling them the same story and they're here for just the time as this. And here you are today, Peter, and you're doing the same thing. You're asking us these questions and you're here as a newly minted, to use your exact word, elder, and you're here for this. And then I think of the congregation and the giving that has been mentioned throughout this thing that has happened through subcontractors, through the companies, through people, through members of Red Mountain and even non-members and even those who don't even intend here in Red Mountain today who have given to this building. They're not even here today. They're in other states. They were here for such a time as this. And so I, I, just, I just look at that. Why were these members, these elders, these leaders, these pastors here? Because they were here for such a time as this, for what Yahweh has for Red Mountain at this time. This scripture, I have used and said this scripture when I'm down, when I'm wondering, when I have doubts, and I look, and it's just in the Lord's faithfulness, he delivers, just like he delivered Queen Esther for such a time as that that she was in. Well, I think in general, um, scripture set the the table, the the foundation for this as we did the read through the Bible. Um, So yeah, many scriptures have spoken to me through this, but uh, and even to build off of your comment and what Bob had said, that as we were unified, because someone said earlier before, I think it was Preston about being unified in the giving, um, but it started with being unified as a church community and going through the word uh, as we read through the Bible. Mm-hmm. And just to even think about the elder retreat that I was at where that was brought up and then to see, again, what we've been talking about, the confirmation, yes, this is definitely of the spirit and to move forward. And then, you know, it got teeth as far as nuts and bolts and uh, bookmarks and and, app and all this kind of stuff. And just how the Lord just blessed it and blessed this like right out, right on the heels of that. So just to think about the uh, tremendous role that scripture has played. And there's, there's many to, to choose from, but Psalm 127 is just, it's got both building and kids in it. So I got to read it. <laughs> right? uh, unless, unless Yahweh builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. 
Unless Yahweh watches over the city, the watchmen stay awake in vain. It is in it is in vain that you rise up early and go to late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from Yahweh, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, the children of one's youth, blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. So just to think about how making these plans even making plans for something as as noble as children. But if not, Yahweh's not in it. And we've talked about that, the timing. So Yahweh has always wanted to minister to kids, um, but what was the timing for that? And, you know, building off what Tobin was saying, this was his timing for such a time as this. And just to live through this process and then come across scriptures like this to come across scriptures as far as he gives abundantly you know beyond we could ever think or imagine to be thinking about seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added as well all these things just keep confirming over and over again um, his word as the driving force behind this as his word has given us the foundation to drive forward the fundraise and the building so that we can spread his word even more Yes, and even even the word, I feel like the Lord at the last uh, elder retreat kind of led us to to Second Corinthians nine as well as as a future, you know, as far as what we see uh, the giving coming to. And this is a pastor for Paul's uh, talking to the church in Corinth about their giving, but he says, you know, he who supplies seed to the sower and and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing. And increase the harvest of your righteousness. So, to some extent, you know, uh, money is money, and 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 the Lord provides it. You know, I think we can get caught up on that, but ultimately, the Lord is the one who provides the seed. Um, but what it results in is an increasing in it, in the harvest of your righteousness. And then it says you'll be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. And man, we we really hope. You know, it's 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 my prayer that that this whole Raise Up project will grow me not just to be generous for this project, but will move me beyond that to be generous in every way, you know, not just with my finances, but also just in, in the way I live and, and treat other people, but but especially with the finances as well. And through that, it says it, it will produce thanksgiving to God. Um, man, something like we're doing in this project can really transform the heart to thanksgiving, which is such an important uh, posture to be in. So I think that passage, you know, it's not just that the passages have led us to where we are historically, but they're also leading us to where we're going in the future too, which is really neat. All right, one last question then to wrap up here. Uh, the, the pledge drive, the recent pledge drive, um, just a, a, a wonderful response to that. Um, and, uh, but we still, you know, it still has to get done. We, we all got to come through on those pledges. There might be some that uh, have not participated, not pledged yet. So what advice would you give to someone who uh, is maybe about to start giving to this campus completion project, to the Raise Up project, for the first time. They've never really uh, maybe even um, committed to uh, giving sacrificially to something like this before, but they're, uh, they're kind of sensing this is the moment the Spirit is calling them into engaging, engaging with this opportunity. What, what, would you, what advice would you give to someone in that situation? I would... <clears throat> I would um encourage them to really pray that through and to really get a sense of connection with Yahweh about that commitment. Um, because there is nothing like putting it all in the line for him before, like just you and him. Forget about the amounts, forget about all that. Just you and the Lord working this through together and doing something like that with him uh, is an incredible moment in a relationship with the Lord. So anytime someone's thinking about jumping in, I would say, do it, jump in, but connect with the Lord 
in the midst of it mm. and, and have heart conversations with him about what this is doing to you. Uh, and the journey that it puts you on to sacrifice and the fears and the worries and the, just the thoughts and all those sorts of things, walk that through with the Lord and then see how he ministers uh, is a really powerful process that I hope uh, everybody at Red Mountain uh, goes through. I think it's, it's incredible. I think the blessing of giving as a couple is also amazing. Um, you know, giving, when you come together as a husband and a wife and you make a decision to sacrifice together, the blessing of that not only just on your marriage um, is overwhelming and it's a joy uh, when you share it together. Um, and I think if people learn to understand that they're not giving money to the elder board, they're not looking at... at um, leaders of the church as who they're giving to, that they, because a lot of people have baggage in the, from the past of giving to people mm. that they've been hurt, yeah. that um, even if that did happen, they're giving to the Lord and that's the, that's the step they can control. After that, they just have to trust that God's going to take it and uh, multiply it. You know, a meditation that the Lord's given me in recent years is, you know, we live close to these beautiful red rocks, you know, I, you know, I think of like Sedona and, you know, the, the way that the rocks have been carved, it, it wasn't just all at one time. It's just the, the small persistent, uh, beating of, of specks of dust over thousands and thousands of years. And I think, a lot of times when we think of the work of the kingdom, we, we think about, man, I can only give so much. And, uh, and, and what, what good is this really going to do? But really what's paving and, and carving the way for the gospel in the world are these small acts of obedience by, by Christians throughout thousands of centuries and years. And, and you know, it, it's not about the amount that you give, but it's this simple act of obedience. It's just dust. You're just throwing dust. And, and the Lord can use it to shape these tremendous uh, canyons for the kingdom. I mean, it's just an incredible thing that the Lord does with just simple obedience. Um, and I've seen that in my own life, just with the, the little, you know, the, that, that I've given. And yet when I look at my history, and again, like John said, not to, it's, it's just how I was raised, but, but I look at the, the, you know, what the Lord has actually been able to do through that, through just simple obedience. I, I would just encourage you to to do that because retrospectively you begin to see all that the Lord has actually done uh, through it. Just simple obedience in, in your giving. All right. Well, thanks you guys so much. Uh, this has been great. Thank you over the last year for those of you that have such a great tolerance for numbers <laughs> and looking at numbers and adulting and understanding all these things that I am way over my head. And, um, but yeah, it's been, it's been wonderful to see how you guys uh, process this stuff, how you work through stuff. And I have been so looking forward to giving people in our church just a, a snapshot, a little taste of, of what it's like uh, as you guys are processing those things. So uh, thank you so much. We've uh, been here since 5.30. It's now past 10.30, so I appreciate the extra time that you gave to this tonight. Thank you, Peter. Um, and uh, look forward to seeing what the Lord's going to do um, in uh, the years to come. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that. It's very hard to trust leaders in the world today. I definitely feel that. And so I'm glad we could give you uh, a little bit of a closer look at the men leading RMCC. And I know that each of them, myself included, want to feel very accessible to you, whether that's connecting with us before and after services and church events, or getting in touch with us at other times in other ways. There is a standing open invitation for you to strike up conversation with us about whatever's on your mind. Uh, I know I've commented about being an introvert, introvert a few times on this show, but please don't let that deter you from walking up and talking with me or any of us. 
we'll just all be awkward together and it'll be it'll be fine <laughs> Uh, every elder's email address is on the church website at rmcchurch.org under about and then leadership team and then scroll down and click on an elder Uh, Alan's isn't working which is either just be a bug on the website or some unusual form of the Lord's judgment on him. I think it's probably a bug on the website. I'm not on there yet, but you can email me at P-A-E-T-E-R-B-O-Y at gmail.com. All right, well, that's it for this episode of the Red Mountain Community Church Podcast. A big thank you to Arian Rossi for organizing, editing, and producing the show, and to the pastors who recommend and select each of the guests we normally have. Uh, You can follow Red Mountain Community Church on Instagram and Facebook, where you can also leave us comments and suggestions to help make the show better. Also, be sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening so you don't miss out on the next episode. And if by chance you want more of me blabbing on topics relevant to Christian geeks, then you can check out my personal weekly show, The Christian Geek Central Podcast. In the meantime, I'm Peter Franson. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on Sunday. Sunday.